Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahillezi la yablabu methatuhu l-qailuhun ve la yusina ma hu l-a'addun ve la yuaddi haqqahu l-mucdahidun ve la yudrikuhu buhdu l-himam ve la yunaluhu gavsu l-fitan ve la yusina li sifatihi haddun mahdudun ve la natun mavcudun ve la vaktun mahdudun ve la acilun mamdud فترى القلائق بقدرته ونشى رياها برحمته ووتد بالسخر ما يدعى نعرض ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيبنا وحبيب رب العالمين بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أحل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن على أدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المبين وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا يغضب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل اللحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله طواب رحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters, before we get started, please recite a surah al-fatiha for the sponsors of tonight's lecture. Please recite a surah al-fatiha for the marhumin of the sponsors of tonight's lecture, whom are Shahid Nakhwi and Qazmiya Shahid. Please recite a surah al-fatiha for their marhumin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear brothers and sisters, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. These are the last, inshallah, these are the last two nights um, for the month of Ramadan. And um, Sunday, inshallah, will be Eid. Uh, it's, it's looking like Sunday will be Eid, inshallah. So uh, please, brothers and sisters, please do remember uh, that uh, the night of Eid, it becomes wajib for you to take out... Uh, Fitra, the night of Eid, it becomes necessary for you to take out Fitra. Uh, and if you want to take it out now, you can take it out now, but you cannot do Niyat, that this is the, the, fitra for, uh, Ram, uh, the Fitra for Ramadan. You cannot do Niyat of it being Fitra, but you can leave money uh, to the side, uh, but you cannot do Niyat for it. So please keep in mind that uh, Fitra is due because it's wajib. And inshallah, um, either me or my father, when they give the lecture for Eid, uh, the Eid sermon, uh, they'll go over or we'll go over what, why is fitra necessary. But um, in regards to our lectures these last two nights, uh, inshallah they'll still deal with some moral, uh, moral principles that Islam wants all of the Muslims to have. Because if all of the people uh, have these moral principles, there won't be so much, um, there there won't be so much uh, differences going on within groups of people in the world. Uh, but to begin with, in terms of our lecture, the ma major sins are the cause for all of misery, evil, and uh, torment in the world and the hereafter. Whatever major sins that we do, you can see the effects of some of those major sins in this world, and you'll be you'll see the some of the effects of those same major sins or other major sins that we do in the next world. And the worst of the sins which one can commit between him and another human being are those that are greatest in harm and danger to humanity themselves. Among the destructive major sins that cause disunity and uh, that cause uh, danger to humanity, not just murder, but backbiting and tailbearing also. These two sins of backbiting and tailbearing are forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they sow enmity, evils and discord among people and lead to destruction. Even though they have been condemned in the Qur'an, even though backbiting, even though 
uh, tailbearing has been condemned in the Quran, even though there are countless narrations or hadith stating the status of backbiters and tailbearers in uh, Akhirah, we still see that these two sins are of the most prevalent sins committed in any society. Tailbearing and backbiting, even though people know that is haram, even though people know the Quran says not to do it. Even though people know that the hadith of the Holy Prophet and the Masumin alayhi salam, they tell you not to do it. Even though they know what the consequences of doing or committing these sins, yet they don't heed these calls. They still uh, commit these sins. And you see that in any society, in any society, these two sins are amongst the most prevalent sins. Why? Because they say that the people do it. Why? Because there is no effect on the other person at the moment uh, meaning for example in murder you see the effect right away it's destroying society right away it's destroying society murder the same thing with other major sins but when it comes to tail bearing and um, uh, when it comes to tail bearing and hypocrisy when it comes to these, these types of uh, these types of sins because people don't see the effect of this sin right away and they think, you know what, there's nothing wrong with it. So, even though backbiting and tailbearing is what might lead to murder, they don't see that, but they just see the murder and they say, yes, murder is a big, murder is this, um, a major sin, but tailbearing and backbiting, no. These two sins, they cause hostilities between people of the same household and between neighbors and relatives. Not just, you can see the tailbearing within relatives. You see that if someone backbites or tail bears, their infighting starts. If someone does that between neighbors, you see that fighting starts. What do these do? They decrease the good deeds and increase the evil deeds and lead to dishonor, shame, and disgrace. So tonight, I just want to focus on backbiting and tail bearing and see what constitutes backbiting and tail Many people, they don't know what backbiting is. They don't know what tail bearing is. Even though they engage in it, they do it without knowing, and this becomes a problem. So, what is backbiting? Abu Zar Ghaffari, who was a divine companion of the Holy Prophet, he asked the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, what is ghiba? Ya Rasulullah, what is backbiting? And the Holy Prophet, he replies, Abu Zar, it is to mention about your brother that which he hates, hates which he despises. Is to mention about a mu'min, is to mention about another Muslim something that they hate, something that they despise, meaning that whatever you're mentioning, yes, you find it in them. You find that quality, you find that trait, you find that action, you find those words that uh, they said. You find that in them. But this mu'min, this Muslim brother or sister in faith, they would not want someone to mention these to others. He, they despise that these things be mentioned. So Abu Zar, he asked, Ya Rasulullah, what if what we say about him is actually true? What if what we say about this other person is actually true? And what does the Prophet reply? The Prophet, he answers them, he says, Ya Abu Zar, know that when you mention that which is in him, you have committed his ghibah. And when you mention that which is not in him, then you have slandered him. Meaning of Abu Zar, if you mention something that is that a quality, a trait that this person has, if you mention that and he wouldn't want that to be mentioned, that is ghibah. But if you mention a quality or a trait that this person doesn't have or an action that this person never even committed or claim that this person said something that he never even said, that's not ghibah, that's slandering this person. That's slander. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He say about backbiters in the Qur'an? He says in verse 12 of Surah Al-Hujurat, and we had said uh, when we started this series that Surah Al-Hujurat, it lays down, it lays down foundation for moral principles, it lays down foundation for uh, good ethical traits that it wants Muslims to have. And what does verse 12 of Surah Al-Hujurat say? It says, وَلَا يَقْتَبْ بَعْضَكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدَكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلُ اللَّهُمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا do not backbite one another. Do you like that one of you eat the flesh of his dead brother? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equated backbiting to eating the flesh of a dead brother in faith. It's narrated that once a few companions, they sent Salman Farsi, the reason for the Shan Nazul of this verse, the reason for the revelation of this verse, is that they say that some of the companions, that they sent Salman Farsi to bring food from uh, for the Holy Prophet. After obtaining the Holy Prophet's permission, he went to Osama bin Zaid, who was in charge of the Holy Prophet's kitchen, meaning uh, from wherever the food needed to be brought. When Salman went, there was nothing in the kitchen. And Salman, he returned to the, the companions empty-handed. When he returned to the companions empty-handed, they laughed at Salman and Osama and branded them close-fisted. Close -fisted. They branded them misers. After they branded the misers, they laughed at them. They came to the Holy Prophet, and the Holy Prophet, he tells them, I see particles of flesh in between your teeth. I see particles of flesh in between your teeth. And they reply, Ya Rasulullah, how can that be? We haven't eaten any meat. We haven't eaten any meat. The Prophet, he says, it's the flesh of Salman and Usama. Then this, was, this verse was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's compared backbiting to cannibalism in the Quran. This is how much he despises that. Why is that? If you go to any society and ask them their opinion about cannibalism, what will they say? What will they say? You will see that they all think of it as a disgusting idea, let alone a disgusting deed. All the societies, they'll say that, no, this idea of cannibalism, eating, eating other human beings, that's disgusting. You will not find one person who, who will extol, who say, yes, you know what, there's no problem with cannibalism, I like cannibalism, we, we should all be cannibals. No. Cannibalism is not a trait that one wants to be associated with. You go to any society, they all despise cannibalism, it's looked down upon. The Holy Prophet, what does he say? He states that on the night of Miraj, I saw some people in hell who were eating dead meat. So I asked Jibreel, who those people were and he replies that they used to eat human flesh in their worldly life. Ya Rasulullah, these people that are eating dead carcasses, they used to eat human flesh in the worldly life. And it was a reference to this verse that they used to backbite about other people. They used to backbite about other people. But the one thing that is clear about this hadith is that the backbiters will be in hell. If they don't desist from the act and don't ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason it's punishment is hell is because of the effects of backbiting. It's about this sin that the Holy Prophet says that backbiting is worse than fornication itself. Backbiting is worse than fornication. Because if a fornicator repents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him. But he does not forgive the backbiter until the person whom he has backbitten forgives. A fornicator, all they need to do is repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But someone who backbites, no, just because they were asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, no, that's not, they're not forgiven like that. That's not how the, the justice of God works. The first thing this backbiter needs to do, if they want to truly be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they need to go and ask for forgiveness from the person or to the person that they backbit. Once that person forgives them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. You see the problem with backbiting. Just think about how many friendships have been ruined because of backbiting. How many neighbors have harbored animos animosity for each other because of backbiting. How many friends have harbored animosity between each other because of backbiting. Not only does it ruin relationship, but it spreads corruption within the community itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that spreading fitna is worse than murder. And why is it worse than murder? Because in murder, you ruin the life of a family, whereas when you spread corruption, you ruin not just the life of a family, no, you ruin a whole community or a society altogether. Imam Jafar Sadiq he tells us that backbiting destroys good deeds like fire destroys wood. Backbiting destroys good deeds the same way that fire destroys or fire consumes wood. 
But when will we realize that our deeds have been consumed? When will we realize that our deeds have been completely destroyed? When the final accounting of our deeds takes place on the Day of Judgment. That's when we'll completely realize, even though we're being warned, even though we've been warned in this world not to do it, yet we still don't, we still don't heed those warnings. And it's reported from the Holy Prophet that a person will be brought for accounting on the Day of Judgment and will be handed his whirl of deeds. When he sees it, when he sees his whirl of deeds, he'll notice that the good deeds that he performed are missing. When he sees that his good deeds are missing, he, he starts yelling. He says, Ya Allah, this is not my record of deeds. Why? Because I don't see the good deeds that I performed. When he says this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll be, he'll, this person will be told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, no, your Lord does not err. Your Lord does not forget. Your Lord does not make any mistakes. Your good deeds have been have disappeared due to backbiting about the people the reason you don't see any good deeds in your squirrel of deeds is because of the backbiting that you used to do one person then another person will be brought and given his record of deeds he will see good deeds in it that he did not perform and he'll also say the same thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he'll say Ya Allah this is not my squirrel of deeds because I find such good deeds that I never even performed in my life there are such good deeds in this world that I never, I don't recollect, I don't remember doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to this person, he'll be told that these are the good deeds. Or these are the good deeds of that certain individual, that certain person who had backbitten about you. And as compensation, his good deeds have been given to you. Person A, backbite person B, on the Day of Judgment... Both of these people are brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Person A, he sees that some of the good deeds that he committed, they're not in his squirrel of deeds. And he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, this, this isn't my squirrel of deeds because I don't see some of those good deeds that I committed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No, these are your, this is your squirrel of deeds. I don't forget. I, I remember everything. I don't forget. I don't make mistakes. This is your squirrel of deeds. The reason you don't see those uh, deeds, those good deeds that you committed or that you did was because you used to backbite. That's why you don't see them. Person B, when he is brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll say, Ya Allah, this can't be my scroll of deeds. Why? Because I see such good deeds in here that I don't remember doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, no, these are your scroll of deeds. Those good deeds that, that you see in there that you don't remember doing, those are the good deeds of that person or a person A who backbit you. This is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine the feeling when you realize that you're not carrying any good deeds with you on the Day of Judgment? What feeling would you, how would you feel? This would be when, on the day of reckoning, when everyone will be worried about themselves, hoping and wishing that their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds. Now, when the scales are brought forth to put your deeds on, you see that you don't even have any good deeds to put. These punishments aren't just for the doer. No, brothers and sisters, there are punishments for the listeners also. For the listeners also. The listeners, they're just as guilty of backbiting as the one who is backbiting. And the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the one who listens to ghibat is one of those who do ghibat. The one who listens to ghibat is from one of those who do ghibat. And why? Why is he just like them? Because you will find that the person who heard ghibat more often than not goes and tells another person or he will be accused of tale-telling and gossiping. The person that I go, if I, if I do ghibat, the person I go and tell, and they're listening attentively to this ghibat, the Holy Prophet says that that person also is doing ghibat. Why? Because more often than not, this person, what do they do? They themselves go and do ghibat. And it is there, and it is this tale teller who will be punished not for one, but two sins. Ribat itself is a sin. Tale telling, 
tailbearing itself is a sin. One for doing libat and the second for tailbearing. The difference between tail telling, tailbearing, and um, backbiting is that backbiting stays at backbiting as long as it doesn't come back to the person it concerns. Meaning that there's three people. I backbite about person A to person B. Now person B, he's listening to this ribat about person A. He's listening to this ribat. If it stays with person B, or it goes to person C, person D, person E. If it stays with person B, that's ribat. If it goes on, that's tail telling, that's tail bearing. That's tail bearing. Not only does the tail teller get twice the punishment, but his du'as are not accepted as well. It's narrated that once there was a drought during the Prophet Musa Sam's time, so he prayed for rain. In the previous Prophet's times, all of those Prophet's times, uh, there used to be karamat that used to happen. For example, if a sacrifice was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sacrifice that was accepted would burn. So karamat and miracles like this would have to happen often in the times of, of the previous prophets. But in the time of Musa there was a drought. So he prays for rain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says... Uh, to Hazrat Musa Alayhi Ya Musa, I won't accept the prayer of your companions and you because there's a tale teller amongst you who doesn't abstain from this deed. There's a tale bearer amongst your companions who doesn't abstain from these, uh, this tale bearing, who doesn't abstain from this evil deed. Prophet Musa Alayhi what does he say? He beseeches Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to tell him the name of that person so that he could be removed from society. Prophet of God, he's saying, Ya Allah, please tell me who that is. Tell me the name of that person. Tell me the name of that companion of mine. So I can remove them from this society. So I can remove them from society. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he replied to Hazrat Musa alayhi He says what? He says, Ya Musa, I myself forbid tale telling. So how could I expose the tale teller? This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where even that he kept hidden from his prophet. When the companions, they all heard this, all of them repented together. When they all repented and they made uh, a vow not to do this, not to commit uh, tail bring and tail telling, that's when it finally rained. That's when it finally rained. The holy month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, it's over. Laylatul Qadr is over. How did we spend 28, 29, 30 days of the month? Because of the because of the coronavirus, I'm sure many of us didn't till till tell as much as we would if we were outside. Because we were confined this itself if you look at it from one perspective is a barakat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which prevented just this being confined inside prevented so many uh, sins from being committed so many sins from being committed if you look at it from this angle from from that angle of the glass being half full and we talked about this too that because of this we were prevented from committing so many sins that we might have committed or those same sins that we would have committed uh, while this virus was going if the virus wasn't spread out in the world. So the spread of this virus, yes, uh, we understand that there are people dying and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take away not this, just this virus but we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take away all of these sufferings and the only way that all of the sufferings around the world will be uplifted will be taken away is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his last hujjah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send this last hujjah to take away not just the coronavirus, no, but to take away all types of suffering from humanity itself. <coughs> These are the nights, brothers and sisters, even the last two nights that we have. We need to make ourselves 
better than we were yesterday. We need to make ourselves better than we were a month ago. The night that was better than a thousand months has gone. But does that mean that we shouldn't make ourselves better? No, of course not. We should continuously try to make ourselves better. The, the Holy Prophet, he says to his companions that when, when I was on Miraj, I saw a woman who had the face of a pig and had the body of a donkey and was being subjected to thousands of punishment. I saw a woman who had the head of a pig or the face of a pig and the body of a donkey and she was being subjected to thousands of punishment. Someone asked the Prophet what her crime was. What was her crime? And the Holy Prophet, he says that she was a tale teller. She was a tale bearer. And if you look at the Hadith, what does the Hadith say? The Hadith says that it was a woman. Whether you agree or not, there's some sins that more men commit than more women and there's some sins that more women commit or they're more prone to committing than men and because this is talking about but this is talking about tale telling and the holy prophet in this hadith says that it was a woman why because more women are prone or more women commit this without even realizing or no they do realize they just don't care there are some sins more women commit than men and there are some sins that more men commit than women so we need to look at each other and see, or we need to look at ourselves and see, you know what, what sin is it that I commit most? And little by little, if not all at once, even though you should stop it all at once, but if you can't, like we, like the story that we uh, talked about yesterday, that companion of the Holy Prophet, he went to the Holy Prophet, he, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I, so, I have so many bad qualities, which bad quality should I uh, leave first? Which bad quality should I let go first? The Holy Prophet, he says, let go of the quality of the bad quality of lying. Never lie. Stop lying. And what did he do? That's the first quality. He said, okay. And little by little, all of the other bad deeds that he used to commit, all of the other bad character flaws that he had, little by little, those bad character flaws, they went. The same thing here. If it can't all be done at once, then little by little, these bad character flaws of backbiting, whether you're a man or you're a woman, they need to be let go of doing ghibat, of tale bearing, of tale telling all of these they need to be let go everyone they need to focus on that on these narrations of the Islam. they all need to focus because these narrations they say look these people that commit these crimes these sins they will definitely be punished if they don't repent and repentance here is not you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. No. We already did a, done a lecture about what, what types of sins require what type of repentance. Three types of sins require three different types of repentance. And we already did a lecture on that and I don't want to go over uh, that same uh, topic again. But you see that the sin of Tilburg, the sin of Ghibat, it requires what type of repentance? Just saying, Ya Allah, please forgive me? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Our ulama, they say that when a tale teller or a tale bearer comes to you bringing these fruits of hell, you should do six things. And these six things, everyone needs to listen to these six, six things and see whether or not they do these things. What are those six things? Firstly, do not believe the tale teller and do not accept their story as true. One. Two. Secondly, the ulama, they say to restrain him from tale telling and advise him against it. This person that's tale telling, this person that's tale bearing, tell them uh, to stop doing that and advise them not to do it or not to tell it, not to tell this to anyone else. Third, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are commanded to consider this person to be an enemy of ours for the for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are commanded to consider this person to be an enemy third fourth we are advised not to harbor any misunderstanding about that initial person this tale bearer is talking about 
we're not supposed to harbor any misunderstanding. This person, he comes to you and he says, he says that Fulan person, he said this about you. What am I supposed to do? The ulama are telling me, the ulama of morals, the ulama of ethics, they're telling me what I'm supposed to do. First and foremost, I'm not supposed to believe this person. Second, I'm supposed to tell this person to stop tailbearing. I'm supposed to tell this person to stop saying this and do not tell this to anyone else. That's the second, th that was the second thing. The third thing, because this person is doing ghibad, because this person is tail telling, I'm supposed to consider this person an enemy of mine. If I consider this person an enemy of mine for the, in, in this matter, will I believe what he says? No, of course not. The third. The fourth thing that the ulama they tell us not to, uh, they tell us to do is that they advise us whatever or whoever this person claims has uh, said something about me. The ulama they say that to that initial person we shouldn't harbor any animosity towards them. We shouldn't harbor any hate towards them. We shouldn't harbor anything towards them. That was the fourth. The fifth, the ulama, they say that you should not become suspicious of the initial person to the point where you start spying on them. This Tilbur, he's come and told you that Fulan person said this about you. The fifth thing the ulama tell us not to do is don't start spying on that, don't start spying on that initial person. Don't start spying on that person. And finally, the last one, they say that you should, you yourself should not start spreading rumors. Meaning that this person came to you, he says, a Fulan person said something about you, and now you go and you start spreading rumors about that Fulan person. The ulama, they say don't do this. But what do we do? The total opposite of each and every single one of these points. As, as soon as we hear something from a tale teller, we take it to be true. Even though the ulama, they say, no, reject it, don't accept it to be true. Then without even verifying his truthfulness, what do we do? Because, oh, this person is a friend who's told us. Instead of accepting this person to be an enemy in this matter, we accept him to be a friend. Without even verifying the truthfulness, we go after the person, not the person who just spread this room, not the person who's telling but we go after the person who who spread the rumor and it might not even be true as we found out yesterday Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what did he say in Surah Al-Hujarat in the same surah verse number 6 oh you believe if an evil doer comes to you with a report look carefully into it lest you harm a people in ignorance then be sorry for what you have done Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to investigate reports that are brought to us by any evil doer these people that are tailbearing, these people that uh, spread corruption like this, these people, they're considered to be evildoers. These people are considered to be fossils in light of the Qur'an, in light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what do we do? First and foremost, without even verifying its authenticity, we accept it to be true. Secondly, when we're supposed to advise him to refrain from telling, what do we do? We encourage them by listening to the uh, tale and then accepting their story to be true. Third, when we're supposed to consider him an enemy, we consider him a friend. Fourth, instead of not harboring any mistrust about that initial person, we harbor anger, we harbor hatred towards that person. And the next time we see him, wherever it may be, it might be at the mosque, it might be uh, at a reunion somewhere, it might be out while we're with friends. As soon as we see them, we're ready to argue, we're ready to fight. Did, why did you say this about me? Without even verifying. Fifth, before we even uh, we, before we even get to the fighting, what do we do? We become suspicious of the person. You know what? This is a friend that told me this. We become suspicious of that person who, who backbit us. And then what do we start doing? We start spying on them. About information. Why? Maybe what this tailbearer is saying is true. Maybe that uh, what the person, the backbite, that's what backbiting is, saying something that is true about you. Someone says something about you which is true about you, but you won't, you don't want that to be expressed. You don't want that to be told. That is backbiting. 
what do we do? We'll go and we'll look for information, we'll spy on that person, we'll look for information about them, and then we'll spread that. That's what we do. Instead of not spreading rumors, not backbiting ourselves, not tailbearing ourselves, what do we do? We start gossiping ourselves also. And more often than not, who do we gossip to? Who do we talk about or who do we read but who who do we do riba to? That same person that brought this riba to us. That same person that brought this tale to us. And as the saying goes, one who tells you the defects of others will surely take your defects to another. One one who tells you the defects of others will surely take your defects to another as gifts. And this is exactly what this person will do. Because of this uh, telltale, we end up committing six sins. And this is one of the reasons why the Holy Prophet had said that one who goes here and there telling tales between two people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send fire into his grave. And when he comes out, from his grave, a black serpent will be appointed on him which will continuously chew his flesh until he enters the hellfire. Not for a person who does ghibat, no. For a person who tell tales, who tell, he, who takes these tales and he goes from one person to another. Why? Because what is he doing? What's this person doing? They're sowing enmity, they're sowing discord between uh, people. So brothers and sisters, how can we keep away from these two great sins? That's the question. How can we keep away from these two great sins? So then when we're accountable on that day, the good deeds that we have committed, they do not go to someone else. What can we do? If you, There's a story about Socrates. That he says that they say that... Um, one day a person met Socrates and told him that he has something to tell about uh, Socrates' friend. Socrates he says that the, Socrates, I have something to tell you about your friend, which he has heard from someone else. Socrates, he says, hold on a minute. He tells this person, hold on a minute, before you tell me whatever you need to tell me, can you first pass a test? And the test, it, it, it was called uh, the triple filter test. And it, cons it consists of three questions, that's it. The man agreed, and Socrates says that before you tell me something about my friend, I want to filter what you're going to say. Because he wanted to filter, that's why it's known as the triple filter test. Three questions, each, each question filters something out. So. The first filter of the tr test is truth. Truth. Socrates, he asked the man, Are you sure that what you will be telling me is absolutely true? Are you sure? The man, he replies, No. I just heard it from another person and don't know about the reality. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's false. If it's false all I know is that I heard it from someone else. All right. Socrates says, All right. So you don't know whether what you have heard is true or false. Okay. Now he goes, let's move on to the second filter. The filter of goodness. And Socrates, he then asks him, Are you going to tell me something good about my friend? And the man, he says, no. When the man, he says, no. Socrates looks at him and he says, okay, so... You have something bad to tell me about my friend and you're not even sure if it's true? And then the man, he goes, yeah. So Socrates goes, never mind, let's move on to the third filter. And you still have one more chance. And the next and the last filter in this triple filter test was usefulness. Usefulness. So... The question that Socrates asked the, the man was 
what the man had to tell him about Socrates' friend was that useful for him, for Socrates? And again, the man, he says, no. It wasn't useful. So when Socrates got his answers for the, 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 this test, he concludes that conversation and he replies to the man, if what you want to tell me is neither true, nor good, nor even useful, then why do you want to tell it to me? If what you want to tell me is neither good, nor true, nor useful, then why do I even want to listen? Why do I want to hear it? It has no use to me. It's n no good for me. It has no use for me. It's no good for me. It's not even true. So why should I? Why should I care for it? If we just apply this, when someone comes telling tales, or when someone wants to tell you about someone else, another mu'min person, another Muslim person, if we just apply this, then we can truly abstain from this sin. A lot of people, just a three-step process. A lot of people they don't put these three steps together. And what do they do? They end up engrossing themselves in the same sin that the Holy Prophet has condemned, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned. So brothers and sisters, I just want to conclude this lecture uh, with inshallah. These moral principles that Islam has, these moral and ethical principles, they're for all of humanity to accept. Not just Muslims. Even if you don't believe yourself or even if you don't accept Islam to be a religion, you look at these moral principles and you can say that, you know what, this is a principle, this is a character trait that I want within myself. But if you're a Muslim, then it becomes necessary for you to have these traits. For you, it's not, hey, you know what, I want, uh, I can choose to have. No, it becomes necessary because now you've accepted this religion as a whole. If, the re if this religion has given you more moral principles, then it's your duty to accept those moral principles and it's your duty to implement them and exhibit those same moral principles and this is exactly what Ahlul Bayt did and this is what this month of Ramadan was for for you to bring these types of uh, ethical principles for you to start exhibiting these at the end I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the Imam of our time safe make his reappearance as soon as possible let us, our families, our brothers and sisters, anyone that is willing to sacrifice their life for Him and His cause, be able to sacrifice their life for Him and His cause. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah keep us away from not just these vices that we spoke about tonight, but other vices that we might have. Ya Allah, give us the tawfiq to keep away from all of those sins, to abstain from all of those sins. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to forgive the sins of our family members to forgive the sins of all the mu'mineen, mu'minat and to forgive the sins of all of those marhumeen, mu'mineen, mu'minat that do not have anyone to ask on their behalf Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Please brothers and sisters recite a Surah Fatiha once again for uh, the marhumeen of tonight's lecture Please recite a Surah Fatiha for the marhumeen of Shahid Naqwi and Kazmiya Shahid Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Inshallah, brothers and sisters, I will uh, see you all again tomorrow with our last lecture, inshallah, uh, for the month of Ramadan. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.